Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, coming in for today's video, as usual. Um, as a uh, as I mentioned earlier this week, we will be discussing the topic of the fall of Richmond, Virginia, and somewhat of the siege of Petersburg. Mostly focusing on Richmond, which happened at the very end of the Civil War here in the United States in April of 1865. Today actually marks 160 years since Richmond kind of fell it's actually tomorrow it's actually tomorrow it got occupied but today's the day that they really started evacuating so we're going to do it here combined today and tomorrow here so just to get it done over with um i do have an additional video that i will be i discuss uh, i kind of determined i'm also going to do this month but i will reveal what video that is here at the very end as we go through normal announcements so just uh, kind of get straight into it i suppose we first need to explain where is Richmond, Virginia, and why is this important? Well, Richmond, Virginia is the state capital of the state of Virginia here in the United States. And back during the Civil War, Virginia had seceded from the Union, or the United States, and joined the Confederate States of America, which was most of the southern slaveholding states. And in fact, Virginia did not do this until five days after Lincoln had called for until five days after Fort Sumter, when a President Abraham Lincoln called for troops to be drafted to fight the rebellion that was happening in the southern states, and that kind of pushed Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Arkansas to join the Confederate states. Until that point, they had not. Well, when this happened, uh, previously, the Confederate capital had been in Montgomery, Alabama. But... When Virginia entered, Virginia was like, for some reason, it was like the cornerstone of Southern society. It was viewed as the main big Southern state to be. And for some odd reason, they decided, even though Montgomery, Alabama, in hindsight, would be a heck lot better of a choice to have as a capital, it unfortunately was chosen that, oh, let's put Richmond, Virginia, even though this was at the end of a long chain of supply, so it was kind of difficult to defend Richmond, and on top of that, it was only 30 miles from Washington, D.C., the federal capital. So well within reach of the federal armies. Real smart. But anyway, um, I'm going off my notes here again as well. Uh, during As the war kind of drug on, many Northerners began to see Richmond as the symbol of the Southern nation, as the, of the Southern rebellion or nation, whatever you want to call it. And they started to see this as, this is the symbol of the Confederacy. We need to take this city. And this kind of turned into the main military objective for the Union Army in the Eastern Theater for almost the entire war, pretty much, from about 1862 onwards. And Richmond, during the war, it became quite overpopulated. Originally, Richmond had a population of around 36,000 people before the war began. Well, by 1865, that population had jumped up to 128,000 because of people fleeing and wanting to see shelter and everything else. And this didn't help the city, and it also didn't help that the South, by this point in 1865, as the war drug on, after Gettysburg, the South really kind of went, it was just a matter of when we were going to defeat the South. After Gettysburg, that was their last chance, and after that, it just went downhill. It was just a matter of how long is it going to take before they finally are done. And as not only was the condition in other the Confederate states worsening, but the nation as a whole was very due to various reasons. But Richmond took a downfall after in 1865 in particular, and we're going to discuss this right here. Um. According to my notes that I have written down, uh, basically, things started to go worse in, Rich in the Confederate capital after February of 1865 when Fort Fisher in North Carolina, it was the last supply port that the Confederates really had because at the start of the war, the North, or Union, had put a blockade of all the Confederate coasts which basically kept any exports or imports coming in and out of the South, which kind of, eventually, at the time, at, initially, they had enough to kind of last, but as the war drug on, they really couldn't get nothing in the country, supply-wise, like food, ammunition, guns, nothing like that, clothing. It became a major crippling factor to the South, 
And eventually, by this point, at 1865 here, toward the very end of the war, it had hit its peak. And the Confederates only had one last port. And in February of 1865, that port was finally taken. The South had no ports that they were getting supplies out of anymore. And that just kind of crippled the nation. Well, the Southern... Yeah, well, let's say the Southern nation. I mean, I'm not... I don't support the Confederate cause. Don't get me wrong here. I do not support the Confederacy. I do see for what problems it had, especially on a particular issue, which I think we all know what that is. But I do also recognize it's part of the history that of our country, and I do recognize that although the United States government may not have recognized it, they did for a, for at least four years. They did kind of have their own country, so I will call them a southern nation, although they make it clear they are not that way anymore, and I do not support their ideals. Okay, I just want to make that clear. Do not support their main ideals. But I will recognize what they did. Because it happened. We can't really change that. I know this is very touchy for some people. And I do apologize if I hit any nerves. Um, basically, due to this, surprises had already been soaring in the Confederacy. The Confederacy printed paper money for almost the onset of the war. And honestly enough, it's kind of odd. It was during this middle of the Civil War that our government, the United States... Started printing paper money, too. They kind of copied the Confederates, and look at us now. Now we are paper money, mostly. Um, basically, this caused, of course, the supplies that the Confederacy had left, the prices were now soaring, because it took, they could only produce so many at a time, and on top of that, they weren't getting no new. And for an example, how much the prices were soaring, here, here's some uh, facts here for some statistics. For a barrel of flour in Rich, this is in Richmond. So this is very, and this is Richmond was the most was the second most was the second largest city in the South. Only New Orleans at the time was bigger. New Orleans, New Orleans, however you want to pronounce it, that was the biggest city. Richmond was second. So if it's like this in Richmond, it's probably similar in the rest of the South. One barrel of flour cost fifteen hundred dollars in eight in March of eighteen sixty five to get at least one pound of beef was worth 12 to 15 dollars one pound and a pair of boots 500 and to get just one pound of butter it's going to cost you about 20 not to mention that confederate currency was basically inflated by this time the confederate government had continuously printed more and more of the currency not realizing that it's that there was not really Things were kind of going less, it was less demand, and prices started to go uh, down <laughs> for a brief time. And then as the inflation, as more and more money, the money, as more money went into circulation and people really weren't buying, the prices started skyrocketing. So it wasn't real good. Um, when basically here, if we're looking at, People, and remember, I'm focusing on Richmond mainly here, but keep in mind, this is probably in most of the other cities in the South at this point. And many citizens, due to not being able to buy a lot of food, they survived on something they called Benjamin Hardtack. And basically what this was was a very meager little meal. I don't even know how you call this a meal, really. And it consisted of cornbread soaked in bake, bacon drippings, dried beans, and hot water that had either salt or brown sugar sprinkled in it, on it. So yummy cornbread with basic, basically grease. Let's call it grease, not bacon drippings. We're just gonna go bacon grease. Cornbread soaked with grease, and you get some hot water with it. You put some hot water on it, and you sprinkle salt or uh, brown sugar. Really sounds not only tasty, it just sounds wonderfully healthy. That sounds like it will hold you over a day. Yeah, not going to do that. And this was named after, the Benjamin Hardtack was the nickname the Confederate citizens gave to it after former, they named it after former Confederate Secretary of War, Judah P. Benjamin, who had, but since then left office. He was kind of a fat gentleman, so uh, if, if you ever look at a photo of him, uh, definitely be sure to notice that. And, I, and speaking of photos, we do have some photos today, and I will include them when they kind of fit in here. So I will have some visuals 
this time. Okay. I miss going off the notes here a lot because, as usual, so. Uh, let's see here. What are we looking at? <laughs> Lost my place. <laughs> okay. Okay, we just talked about prizes. Never mind. Uh, many people in the Confederacy, as at, by this point in March of 1865, as the war is finally kind of becoming evident that the South is going to lose any time, many people, made it, and especially in Richmond, Richmond had been an objective for four years, and it had always been kind of, for, the North's attempts to take it had always been flort, thwarted, but mostly by General Robert E. Lee and his Army of Northern Virginia. And I'm pretty sure... We all know who Robert E. Lee is, but in case there's an odd person out there who does not, or does not remember what he looked like, which I would find that extremely hard to believe, here's the dude. This is Robert E. Lee. He was the main Confederate general for the South, and he was in charge, basically, of the defense of Richmond with his Army of Northern Virginia. Well, due to this, many people in Richmond were still denying that the war was going to come to an end. They thought, oh, there'll be a miracle that's going to happen, and we'll be saved. Kind of, in an odd way, it's almost similar to Hitler at the end of World War II, where he, during the Battle of Berlin, he believed things were suddenly going to turn around. He believed the Nazis were going to develop some kind of miracle weapon, or some big old magical little victory was going to happen on the field, and honestly, he couldn't come to reality that uh, they're in your capital, and they're literally, the Russians are blocks away from where you are. This ain't changing. <laughs> and the Confederates kind of, as though they're nothing like, well, I'm not going to say nothing like, because they shared one thing in common, though not in that form exactly. But they had this kind of same mentality that, oh no, this will never happen. Uh, yeah, well. <laughs> Excuse me. As the military situation also began wor worsening around Richmond, there were calls by certain members of the Confederate government to possibly petition the North for a truce, a peace agreement to maybe negotiate with them that might, although it wouldn't conserve the entire Confederacy, it might conserve maybe part of it. At this point, they just wanted to preserve part of their southern nation that they had tried to form. And there were at least two attempts made to try to maybe bring about this truce. And the first time was probably the most significant. And I will provide a video to this in the links. Probably at the end of this video. I will have to see what I can do there. If not, I will let it know in the comments page. Where, if I put it on the links page in the channel. But we'll see. And this was on February 3rd of 1865. Confederate Vice President Alexander Stevens. And the Assistant Secretary of War for the Confederacy, which, who was judged, who was a judge, who his name was John Campbell, Campbell, uh, they met with General Ulysses Grant, Abraham Lincoln, and Secretary of State William Seward on a river boat called the River Qu on the, on a steamboat called the River Queen, and this was on, near Point City Point, Virginia. And they basically came to talk about this by maybe discussing a possible truce that might salvage part of the Confederacy and might prevent a fight to the end. The Confederate government wanted to maybe have an end to the war that, although they might not have the entire country intact, they'd have some of it. Unfortunately, Lincoln and the others, unfortunately for the Confederates, I mean, uh, unfortunately for the nation, but unfortunately for the Confederate, Lincoln and his little cohorts, especially Seward, kind of dictated to the South that there would be no armistice that would be offered to the South as long as, without a total dis dissolution of the Confederacy, there had to be an end to slavery and the factor there was an, it had to be unconditional restoration of the Union. Basically, Lincoln was telling them, no, there is no way you're going to get an armistice that ends with the Confederacy remaining in any form. It's going to be readmitted to the United States, either way you like it or not. And basically, when he, this came clear, and in, uh, in the video they mentioned that, Stevens kind of mentions this, he asked Lincoln, well, would the southern states be readmitted in time to block the ratification of this supposed 13th Amendment, which was going to end slavery and was being debated in Congress at the time, and Lincoln made it very clear, I'm not readmitting you that soon. Not with that kind of power. And even if I did, 
I'm pretty sure I could pass it because I only need at least I need all the northern states and all the northern ones are likely going to ratify it. And I would only need two southern states. And by this point, the Federals had occupied Louisiana and Tennessee for so long that they had kind of persuaded the citizens to side with them. So even if the South had been had its states readmitted to the Union in time to block the threat to try to block it, it wouldn't have worked because they had two states that were likely going to join with the North. And it became very apparent that Lincoln was not going to offer the Confederacy existence. You either surrender right now and end this, or we're going to continue this. And Lincoln was hoping that the South would come to just outright common sense and say, hey, we've lost the war, let's give this up and prevent more bloodshed. But of course, the South was not willing to do that. They still hold on to that slim little hope, although I don't know where the heck they were getting it from. And basically, that was the end of that talk. Another small opportunity came in March during the battle here that we're going to talk about, the siege. And Robert E. Lee offered a white flag of truce at Petersburg, Virginia, which is where the siege is going to happen that we're going to talk about here in a second. And this was, he pro gave it to, he offered this to Grant, proposing an, a, basically, a convention to discuss the end of, basically, conflict between the two. Well, after Grant... Uh, wired Secretary of War Edwin Stanton, it became he declined the offer because they Stanton had basically said anything that promotes the survival of any part of the Confederacy in any form will not be accepted. And that became very clear that you're going to rejoin us whether you like it or not. That you are United States territory. You're not your own nation. And in case anyone does not know, although he's on your $50 bill, this is Ulysses S. Grant, who was the main northern general by this point. He was Lincoln's uh, commander-in-chief of all the Union armies at that time, and he actually went to be our 18th president and got elected in 1868. He's on our $50 bill. So that is General Grant. So that brings that. Now we're going to get here to the siege that was happening that kind of led to Richmond's downfall. I won't discuss this a whole lot in depth, but we'll get to the main points here. And this was what led to Richmond's downfall. It was known as the Siege of Petersburg for the city of Petersburg, Virginia, which was 23 miles south of Richmond, Virginia, which the federal armies were besieging. And if they broke through Petersburg, Richmond was wide open. It would be taken. So basically, it was the critical strategic defense point to kind of the last-ditch defense of Richmond. As long as the Confederates held Petersburg, there was no way the Federals were going to get to Richmond, Virginia. There was no way that was going to happen at any point. And General Grant sent his northern armies to start besieging. They started a siege of Petersburg in June of 1864, and basically hoping that they could break through the southern defenses and finally capture Richmond once and for all. And, of course realizing what was going on and realizing how d dire the situation could would be if they captured Petersburg, General Lee of the Confederates put his forces and organized the Confederate defense there with his Army of Northern Virginia. Both sides were constructing massive fortifications such as trenches, especially trenches, and this is kind of odd because this was before World War One, and they were almost rival some World War One trenches in scale, though not in yeah, absolute length, although some some of the trenches were pretty long. Some of them actually got to about 35 miles in length. And throughout the summer, Grant's army repeatedly had small skirmishes and battles with Lee's army around Petersburg, and, but the losses for the North were continuously heavy. But keep in mind here, the North had a lot more industrial might, and they had a lot more manpower. And they, at this point, their morale is very high because they know the end of the war is near. It's just a matter of time. In the South, they don't have much industry. They don't have a lot, whole lot of manpower because a lot of their young men have been killed now. And they're not willing to really conscript black soldiers because of their racism, where the North was more than willing to enlist them. Although they were still kept in segregated units, but that's a whole other topic altogether. So at this point, the North can replace its losses. The South cannot. The South had maybe a third of the population of the North. It was a lot smaller, so they didn't have as much men to maybe throw around here. And for our 
image here for Petersburg, so you maybe know what one of these fortification trenches look like. Let me see here. I do have an image. Mm, there we are. This is one of the trench networks at uh, Petersburg. This was one of the Confederate trenches. And you can see, it is just a nicely done trench. I mean, trench warfare is not part of the general, especially as we would learn later in World War One. but it's kind of very intricate and very well laid out for a trench. That was what they were in at Petersburg. And this siege... It went on throughout the summer, and even by the end of the summer, there wasn't a big major breakthrough yet, but there were two big key things that had been happening. And in August, um, Grant's army managed to seize the Petersburg-Weldon Railroad, which was the main railroad transportation hub in Petersburg. Petersburg was a main railroad uh, transportation hub, so it, cut, it controlled a lot of the railroads that were coming out of Richmond. And on top of that, on September 29th, the Grant's army also managed to capture Fort Harrison, which then kind of even crippled the Confederate outer defenses of Petersburg as well. The outer defense is where the main defense was. They knew that if they broke the outer, there was no chance they could defend the inner. So there were small inner defenses at Petersburg. The Confederates didn't really stock that well, and they knew the outer defenses, if that was lost, Petersburg was lost, Richmond was lost. So that was gonna, what was going to happen there. Although these two things have been done, Grant failed to kind of break into Petersburg, and Lee still held the city, but that did not stop him from keeping the siege up for another couple months. And as it dragged on, the conditions really worsened for the Confederate soldiers in particular because of the factor the railroads in the South, and it was everywhere in the South, like infamously near Atlanta and Georgia, where General Sherman had deliberately told his soldiers tear up the rail lines, burn the land, anything, because as he put it, uh, war is hell. Let these rebels learn what that is. And he wasn't exactly wrong. And due to this, the South couldn't easily transport troops. They couldn't easily transport supplies. A lot of the railroads that they would use were now out of date. Remember, they did not have cars back then. And there's not exactly major rivers in every part of the country. So railroads were a major source of transport for supplies and armies. And this was no longer good. And because of this ill supply, many of the Confederate soldiers were ill-fed to the point that they were basically uh, exhausted to the almost the point that they were going to die or pass out. And many troops couldn't even move and meet, move fast enough because they even lacked cavalry horses and mounts. They didn't have those or pack animals. They didn't even have animal means of transport, which could really put down their mobility. And many Confederate soldiers, either they kind of deserted due to the fact that they started feeling that hopelessness, the war is almost over here, or they were just exhausted. They couldn't do it no more. In March of 1865, this is when the breakthrough kind of occurs. Let me take a drink here a second. Okay. And anyways, in March of 1865, the breakthrough starts to finally occur that's going to finally make Richmond and Petersburg fall. And that is the factor in that month, earlier in the month, the North managed to battle another battle with the Confederates in front of Petersburg, in front of the trench lines. And this time they managed to capture Fort Steedman. And this not only took another critical defense point away from the Confederates, but it also weakened Grant's it also weakened Lee's numbers, sorry, not Grant's. Lee now had only about 50,000 troops defending Petersburg, and Grant now had like 120,000. I think the odds are against him. Even an experienced commander knows you can't hold out real long, usually, with that much of a numer numerical inferiority. And it got worse until on April 1st, Grant's army destroyed a major Confederate force that Lee had sent to attack under his generals uh, George Pickett and Fitzhugh Lee, and this was called the Battle of Five Forks. This really kind of ended that little defense, and it kind of came clear, yeah, we're, Petersburg's going to fall here. And on, after this kind of failed, on April 2nd, it got so exhausted that uh, when another attack came from the north, the Confederate defenders finally 
fell back to the inner city and they left the outer defenses. Petersburg was now fallen. It was done. And realizing that he could no longer even remotely hold Petersburg if he wanted to save his army and fight another day, Lee immediately before he him and his army fled Petersburg, he wired Confederate President Jefferson Davis in Richmond that he should evacuate Richmond, that him and the Confederate government should evacuate Richmond that night, that they should get out of there because the Federals are now coming. This is Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Keep in mind, though, though the South tried to form its own nation, it largely kept the United States system of government intact. The only difference was that the states had a little bit more power and the fact that their constitution protected slavery as an institution. But they basically had this, they had a House of Representatives, they had a Senate, they had a cabinet, they had a president, a vice president. It was basically the United States, but with a few modifications. Because although they had seceded from the United States, they still liked that form of government. They just deemed that it had been dominated by the North and it hadn't gone their way. So that is kind of the basics on Petersburg here that solves that. Now we get to the fun part, which is the fall of Richmond, which is not really that fun. It's just we get to see the pretty destruction photos. Okay, as, for, as we mentioned, Lee sent this to Davis, and this April 2nd was on a Sunday. It was early in the morning, and he, Davis was actually got this message handed to him by an aide while he was attending a church service, and he quietly, after getting the message, he quietly stepped up out of his pew and exited the church very quietly, and he went directly to the War Department building in Richmond, and he gave the official orders to start the evacuation of the city. By mid-afternoon, though, people kind of started to panic, though, because they started noticing that the government was filling the streets with the wagons and everything else that were going to be needed to get supplies and stuff out of Richmond and evacuate it. So they kind of knew, uh-oh, ends here. I mean, it's finally here. It, this ain't a lie no more. They kind of realized that. It kind of got hectic during this evacuation. I mean, the Confederates were in such a hectic situation. They really, some things they did that kind of seemed odd. But it really shows you the Confederacy was on its last limbs. It's it's finally come to an end. And the government clerks loaded boxes of important documents such as uh, the names of troops that were enlisted, the financial dealings, political dealings that the Confederate government had done. And they took these, either load them into boxes and put them onto wagons or any that they couldn't fit on the wagons. They piled in a big pile and burned them in the street. Which is why when we usually look at, uh, if you ever notice, if you look at the Civil War battlefields or something on a Civil War battle and it comes to the casualties, how it's always usually with the Confederates we have to estimate how it says with Confederate casualties it's estimated. That's because that's what we have to estimate because the documents that would have had those casualties listed were burnt or lost in the evacuation of Richmond and they never got seen again. Supply depots across the city that had the last remaining major food stocks and stuff like that for the city, they were opened up. Usually they were kept under lock and key, but the Confederate government kind of judged it's better to let the citizens of Richmond have the supplies than to let the enemy, to let the Federals come in and take it for themselves, and then they can invigorate them, their armies and chase us even further. Which was going to happen regardless, but that was their thinking. Which exactly, in the terms of warfare, is probably not a bad idea. And then, as in this chaos was starting, a fire began to break out. And this started out in front of the Capitol building, which is the state Capitol building of Virginia. It was just taken as the main Capitol building for the Confederacy at the time. And this fire broke out in front of that as a whole pile of unused new banknotes... As I mentioned, there was too much money going around, just caught on fire, was accidentally caught on fire. And this fire actually spread to multiple buildings in the industrial heart of Richmond and destroyed a lot of the commercial area and the industrial factories that they had. And it devastated a small part of Richmond. As night fell, mobs began to kind of form the city as people really started to riot now. And the resulting riots set fire to even more of the buildings as they started to get kind of out of control. The government train, the gov where they were still sending trains out of Richmond to get a lot of the supplies out. There was still another rail line that was free to them at this time. 
and there was a train for the Confederate government to load all the Confederacy's gold deposits on, and the cabinet members and the President Jefferson Davis himself to get on this, and it left at 2 a.m. in the morning, and it went southward to Danville, Virginia, on... And basically, at the same time, the Confederates had a small riverboat fleet on the James River, which is the river that goes right through Richmond. It's the river there that goes through it. And this small riverboat fleet was given orders to be scuttled. Destroy the fleet, get rid of the boats, don't let the Union capture them. And of course, this was done, and you could see the fireworks from these things for miles off. Even the Union kind of reported that as they were kind of getting ready to march out, Later, a few couple hours later, they could see some sparks off in the distance, and this was later determined to be those boats exploding. And the citizens of Richmond saw basically fireworks, in a way. And that's what they saw. And then, at the same time, the city's gunpowder magazine was blown up to ensure that the Federals wouldn't be able to have that access to that gunpowder. That would be denied to them, that way they couldn't have it. At 7 a.m., by seven, and that was basically the crazy night that Richmond kind of had. By 7 a.m. on April 3rd, a regiment of Federal Cavalry entered, came over the hills and entered Richmond. And it was surrendered by, to, the city was surrendered to them by an 80-year-old man under the, 80-year-old major whose name was Joseph Mayo. Now here's the ironic thing in this, these Federal Cavalry that they surrendered the city to were Black Cavalry. The very race that the Confederates had deemed was inferior had Dean wasn't right, that they were constantly inferior, they weren't the same as the white man, these were the ones you're now surrendering to, proving they're equal, in my mind. They're equal to the white man. There, There's no difference between black and white. There's no difference between Hispanic and Asian. We're all human beings. And the Confederates kind of had it. I think it's kind of creative in a way. I don't think it was intended. It just happened to be that way. But I think it was kind of cool that the soldiers that accepted the surrender of the city ended up being black, which kind of, to the Confederate residents of the city that were still there, I'm sure came as a big shock and insult to them, saying, ha ha, you lost, and look, the people that you downgraded are the ones you're surrendering to. Not that I think they took any malice on it, but the fact or it was ironic to see their way of life you basically shooting in your face. Your way of life is wrong. There is better ways. And this was the official surrender. More federal troops continuously arrived as the hours kind of went by. And at this point, Richmond is still, not only is it still smoking, there's still some of the fires are actually burning. And they some of these troops actually have to reroute their directions for the city just to avoid the flames. And do, as they do do this, Many had to change their course due to that, and they couldn't even use the bridges to get into the city because the, as the Confederates retreated, after the trains had gotten out of the city and most of the government, they blew the bridges up. They detonate, They basically blew up the bridges. At 8 a.m., basically this marks the big pinnacle point, and that was the Confederate flag that had been on top of the Capitol, Virginia State Capitol building, or as they knew it, just the Capitol building of the Confederacy. It was lowered, and the Stars and stripe, Stripes was raised at around 8, at 8 a.m. on April 3rd of 1865, which basically meant Richmond is ours. It's now taken. A day later, President Lincoln actually came down with his, he actually brought his son with him. His name was Tad. Well, Thomas, but I, I think it was Thomas, but they all called him Tad. And he came down with his son, and they actually toured the city buildings, and they even toured the executive mansion that Jefferson Davis had used as his his equivalent of the White House during his time in Richmond, him and the government. And that kind of concludes with Richmond falling. Now, they were, like a month later, Jefferson Davis and the government were kind of mostly captured in May. Lincoln was shot about two weeks later and all that, and we're going to hit that here in a couple weeks. Um... We'll show some photos here of what Richmond looked like, I suppose, before we really get into the ending sequence here. This is a photo of the commercial district taken on April 3rd of 1865 in Richmond that morning. What it kind of looked like. This was in Richmond. Some, as you can see, buildings thrown out and fell apart collapsed because of the chaos that it had the night before. 
ensued the night before, I should say. This is in front of the canal basin. It's no, the canal basin is no longer there in Richmond, but it's mainly up. Uh, it was there was a canal at the time, and there's a small bit of it near the Treadgar Ironworks in Richmond. I don't know if anyone lives there or knows where about that, but the canal's gone. But the state this one you can actually see the state capitol building, which is still there. It's still there today. This kind of shows the wide view of devastation in Richmond that morning. Right here was the canal basin, and you can see the burnout buildings over here. And this one right here is the state capitol building or capitol. This was Richmond that morning. This is a photo of one of the destroyed bridges leading out of the city that the Confederates had blown up on their way out. On that early, that early, early, late that night. What am I going to call it? Um, this is just a map of Richmond, Virginia at the time. And I'm going to point something out here. And this map is actually very close to what it is today. So if you actually wanted to go on Google Maps or Google Earth or whatever you use for a map, Thing, if you look up directions, you can actually compare this map to what they have on there. And a lot of, I looked this up personally, and a lot of it's still matching like these islands in the uh, James River Highland like, uh, And the bridges are still larger there. But anyway, the main part of the city that burned was mostly right in here, this area, where the main governmental building and industrial areas were. This was the part that caught on fire. Not all the city caught on fire, but mainly the and of course, all three of these bridges were blown up. And for our final photo we have here, we have a picture of the Gallego Mills in on that morning when they came. And this one, you can kind of actually still see the smoke in the photo. It's kind of blurry in the back, and that's actually the smoke as the buildings were still kind of dying down in the fire. Mm -hmm. In the city and it destroyed the night before mostly by rioters actually rioters had actually been the ones that destroyed that so that kind of concludes richmond's fall and all that so that is it for that topic now if there was any questions i'd be more than happy to answer them if you got them put them in the comments below uh i will be doing I kind of came to this conclusion. I know I mentioned where I was going to do a video on Abraham Lincoln's assassination. I was going to do one on the Titanic. I'm going to do one on Chernobyl. Well, I'm going to add another one to that list. And since we talked about this, we mentioned that Lee's army went on the run after Petersburg. Well, we all know where that leads, and that leads to Apotomatux, which is basically the end of the Civil War, almost. At least with Lee's army. And I will discuss that, and that will be on April 9th. So that will be next week. We will discuss that so that would be our one of our topics for next week i'm still gonna have to decide another one but i will tell it when it comes on the discussion page i will list it when i find whatever the other topic will be so that is what things stand at right now now i don't i hope everyone is also doing well with the coronavirus going on because i know this is like kind of hitting near the high peak is what they're i guess they're calling it the peak of what we're going to have with deaths and cases and everything else. At least in my home state, we have a, just basically been announced that on Monday, our stay-at-home order is going to be extended to May 1st. So, plenty of time to do YouTube videos. <laughs> um, plenty of time to do a lot of things here. Um, so, I just hope everyone's staying well with that. If anyone has does have it, I, ho I wish you the best. I ho hope that you don't have any complications or nothing from it. And that you, your family stay safe as well. So that is on that topic. So I think that's all we have for this video. So again, as always, comment in the comments below. Any questions you may have, I will post some, a link, at, at least one link to one video that relates to one of the peace kind of conferences that they had with the, the Confederates had with the North to try to end the Civil War before Richmond fell. It's actually from the 2012 movie Lincoln. With Daniel Day Lewis in it, so that if anyone ever wants to go see that movie, I, I'd highly recommend it to see it. It's actually pretty good. Um, let's see. Yeah, other than that, just be sure that if you like the video, like it, uh, subscribe to the channel if you'd wish to see more, and I will give updates when I can here. And hoping everyone stays well. So, I guess this is me signing out for today, and have have good afternoon and have a good rest of your week and upcoming weekend.